All right. Good morning, everybody. And uh, I hope to see the rest of our fellows sign on, although they said they had some trouble signing in. And um, oops, click control on the keyboard. All right. Anyway, uh, first of all, I want to welcome all the new fellows from Swedish and PBI. And uh, hopefully you had a good first couple days of your fellowship. And, uh, you know, it's, it's going to get better and better. We are in uh, some extraordinary times. But this is a talk that uh, we've been giving to our fellows every year. And uh, it's just sort of a philosophy talk and, and what to expect during the next year. So here are my disclosures. And we started this as an introductory talk for our TBI fellows. So it's going to be new to all our new fellows and, of course, all the old fellows. Uh, but I do apologize to the older TBI partners. And they keep on thinking that the fellows are getting younger and younger. But it's just that we're getting older and older. And the good news is uh, we're getting old enough that, uh, you know, the talk is beginning to sound new. So if you fall asleep, now that we have our uh, Zoom, and, and I want to thank the, uh, all the gals from Seattle Science Foundation. So please turn off your mic and turn off your camera. So don't snore so the fellows can actually listen to the talk. So this is going to be a different kind of year for us. We're going to have new challenges and new opportunities. But I'm a firm believer that uh, strength comes out of adversity. It's going to be an interesting year, but our patients will continue to need our services. And I think that all of you have found out, even in the short time that you started uh, your fellowship, that there's plenty of cases. The problem is that the personal connection of reading facial expressions behind masks is temporarily gone. And that is a big deal. And uh, But we'll make up for it in other ways. Telemedicine also has become an important part of our current practice. In fact, this is about the only way we get to see our patients' faces uh, before surgery. So we're going to have to be creative. We're going to have to sharpen our skills of observation and listening. So my first pearl for you is uh, never ask anybody to do what you wouldn't do yourself. And here's a picture of me mopping the floor just to help with turnover. And this goes on to say that the next point, treat everybody with respect and kindness. And you will find out that your office staff will either love you and do everything for you, or they'll make your life miserable. And if you come to the OR, as one of my uh, past fellows did, he said, basically, I'm the king of the OR, now that Dr. Geyer left. Uh, you're done, and word spreads fast, and uh, the nurse in the OR will make your life miserable. And it's the same thing with the floor nurses. If you're nice to them, they'll do whatever they can to, to help you. But if you're not, they will make your life hell. Um, in addition, if you... Um, if you have seen this recent TED talk, it was I had to somebody send it to me and it was about people living to the age of 100 and older. And they looked at a bunch of different factors. And the number one factor was those that lived the longest are those that had many social interaction throughout their day. And that was the single most important factor. So it goes back to my philosophy is that it doesn't cost you anything to smile and say, hello, how are you to all of those that you encounter? And I as soon as I come in the back door of our building, and I don't care if it's somebody that's in the receiving area and shipping and all, I just say hello to them. Because uh, number one, it doesn't cost anything. Number two, it's, it's just a way of making uh, somebody else feel better about you know, what's going on and the fact that you recognize them because you don't realize that as a physician, everybody looks up to us. And some people think that you know, we're, we're above that, but uh, show them the human side of yourself. So the supreme myth of fellowship is that you will learn everything you need in 12 months. Well, we know that that's false. It will take a lifetime, and much of what you learn during your fellowship year, you won't be doing 20 years from now. I think all of us uh, veterans can look back and look at the surgery cases that we do or how we did those surgery cases and see that we are doing them totally differently. You know, minimally invasive is taken off. We have robotics and navigation. And spine is very, very exciting. It continues to evolve. And we're seeing even uh, more and different problems with the aging population. When I went through my fellowship, we rarely operated on a patient that had adult scoliosis. And now, with our powerful internal fixation, we basically can take care of anything. So if you don't learn something every day, 
you're asleep at the wheel. In other words, there is something, even at my age, I learn something every day and, and you never stop learning. This is a constant uh, process throughout your career. And that's why at the end of your fellowship year, uh, when you take a job, they call it going into practice because now you're going to practice your skills, but you're still going to learn something every day. So this is a transformation year as you focus on spine surgery alone. Uh, but if you have a hammer, not everything's a nail. In other words, not everything is treated surgically. A orthopod and or the neuropods, we're going to transform me just to a spine surgeon. And this is for the orthopods who uh, came from their program is leave the brutane behind because spine surgery is much, much more delicate than anything that you've ever had experienced. The neurosurgeons obviously have been used to that their whole career. We want you to learn to think critically. In other words, not everything you read in the literature is, is gospel. And you have to be able to read it, evaluate it. And even as your attendings talk to you and uh, try to teach you things, again, think critically and ask questions. You should read, read, read. This is your last year that you will have that you can dedicate to forming a firm base of knowledge for your spine. And you wanna soak up your daily experiences like a sponge. You're gonna work with different surgeons and everybody has their different techniques and their different philosophies. And each interaction you have will be integral in your transformation during this year. Observe every move in surgery and try to look at the forest and not the trees. And what I mean by that is that sometimes uh, you're concentrating so hard as you're dissecting the nerve or, or doing the decompression that you inadvertently may <laughs> be causing some damage to the peripheral tissues or when the setup was taking place, you didn't take in, well, why was Dr. So-and-so doing this during the setup? So be observant of everything and ask lots of questions. Because at the end of the year, your philosophy and your techniques will be a combination of all that you have seen over the year. Now, the second myth is that there's nothing a spine surgeon can't fix with surgery. And unfortunately, now that we have these powerful internal fixation devices and deformity has become such a popular thing, it's amazing what we're doing. It's amazing, you know, the, the amount of correction we can get. It's amazing the amount of hardware we can put in. Um, but still, you have to be humble because, you know, the answer is wrong. We can't fix everything with surgery. Sometimes we just can't do it. A spine surgeon is somebody who's trained in both non-operative and operative methods, rehab and biomechanics, the psychological aspects, and most importantly, understands the long-term implication of surgery. Because hopefully your patients will be yours for your career, unless you do something to the contrary. And unfortunately, it is your own personal experiment and experience that you will gain as you follow your patients through. Myth number three, all spines are cure, all spine problems are curable. Well, these are some quotes from some of our TBI PAs. And uh, one said, lady, we can fix your toaster, but we can't fix your back. Now this comes from the PA that works with Dr. Ziegler and Dr. Blumenthal and I, and this is Jessica's. And she says, Mrs. Jones, the reason they call it back surgery is because you keep coming back. And she will say this with a straight face, but unfortunately, that's true. Now, the reality is if we look at a very simple problem in spine, for example, a herniated disc uh, in, the, in the neck and the low back, uh, we know that you have about an 85 to 95% cure rate. And it's very, very satisfying, but the number isn't 100%. So isn't that amazing? A simple little problem like a herniated disc, you think, oh, you go and take it out and you say, okay, you're going to be 100% better. No, it's not 100%. Uh, if you do surgery for axial neck or back pain, we know that we have an 80% chance of lessening it, and surgery can be really, really satisfying in those patients. But oftentimes, it's difficult for us to identify the pain generator. 
And it can be very, very frustrating when you do a wonderful operation and the patient comes back and they're still complaining, complaining. And let's look at deformity. We, can, we have the ability to do fantastic sagittal realignment for deformities, but it's complex surgery and not without a significant complication rate. And unfortunately, the spine is just like the heart in that one surgery may not last a lifetime as the spine continues to age. And unfortunately, um, we all have patients that we've done one operation on, they come back years later for a second operation and another operation, another operation. It would be nice to know that we can do one operation and fix them for life, but that's not going to happen. And that's not the reality, at least not today. So much of spine decision-making is gray. In fact, the majority of it is gray, but there certainly are black and white, indisputable surgical indications. And of course, there has to be a surgically remediable lesion. And these are the obvious ones, loss of bowel and bladder control, a progressive neurologic deficit or myelopathy, severe unrelenting sciatica and arm pain, fracture dislocations, tumors and infections that are not amenable to non-surgical options. Now, what about neck and low back pain uh, surgery, an indication for a fusion? Well, obviously, tumor resections, infection recalcitrin to other care, trauma, deformity, and incapacitating low back pain. But what about the cure rate for axial pain? Again, we're just talking about for patients that have centralized neck and back pain. Uh, there is really no 100% cures. And even with the great data we have from all of our uh, six FDA lumbar IDE trials, the results are really, really good. I mean, 90% of patients are happy they had their surgery. On the average, they get a 50% reduction of pain, a 50% improvement of functional activities. And many of those patients do achieve pain-free levels, but these are from the FDA data and you have to be honest with your patients. And when they say, will I be normal? you have to have a frank and honest discussion with them about reasonable expectations because pay, uh, unhappy patient makes an unhappy surgeon. So again, you have to be honest with your patients and discuss with them what is reasonable and what is not reasonable. Now, this is something that uh, I always get a kick out of, the size matters. And uh, when the fellows first start, they see a big disc herniation, and they say, oh, my God, we need to take that out, or, or when are we going to do this case? Well, you know, is it really an important indication for surgery? Well, not really, because this is one case where size doesn't always matter. So let's take a look at some examples. Remember, we operate on patients, not on x-rays. And in fact, William Moster said, a good doctor operates on disorders. A great doctor operates on patients with disorders. So you want to operate on a patient with a problem, not on the x-ray. So the size of the disc oftentimes doesn't correlate with the symptoms. And it's amazing how often you'll see either cerv severe cervical stenosis or lumbar herniated disc or stenosis, and they just began having symptoms recently. So you have to take into account the total picture. In other words, compared to what? If the radiologist says that there is a 10 millimeter disc herniation, does that mean it's a horrible disc? I mean, how big is a patient's canal? And is some of the abnormality, um, for example, in the lumbar spine, mass effect from blood from a torn epidural vein? And you will see during the course of your fellowship, you will get in there and you may uh, be operating on a patient with a herniated disc, and lo and behold, there's not much of a herniated disc. Some of that may have been epidural blood. And also, is there significant cord compression? And the questions you know, that are important to ask is, does the patient participate in potentially risky activities? So in reality, you are the one that has to look at the films, and you can't go by the report alone. Because remember, the radiologists are reporting everything. They don't have the patient in front of them. They don't have the ability to examine them. So if they say there's a 10 millimeter disc herniation, and you look at the films, and there's only a 14 millimeter canal, that's that's probably a pretty bad problem. But if it's a 10 millimeter herniation in a 24 millimeter canal, you know maybe the patient has a little sciatica. Maybe it's not you know a big deal. Or if they read that there's a six millimeter herniation in the neck in a congenitally narrowed canal, and you look at those uh, pictures, that could be a potentially dangerous in a patient who's very active, even if they're asymptomatic. 
So again, you have to look at the films and not just read the report. So here's a couple examples of some disc herniations. So here's a 10 millimeter disc herniation in a 25 millimeter canal. Well, I mean, it's really not so bad. It, you're compressing the S1 nerve root on the left, but it's not like it's, uh, you know, you read the report and you get all nervous and say, oh, we got to operate on that. On the other hand, here's a patient that has a massive herniation, does not have a quad equinus syndrome, and you're wondering how this patient walks. Well, this is not someone you would let walk around with this, but you will see tremendous variation in how the body responds. So here's a massive herniation. You can't even see the fecal sac. It's going to be a bear to do the decompression. And they have maybe a little bit of sciatica. So the reality is, if you look at the studies, show that large, small, and even extruded discs do respond to conservative care. And one of the myths are that, oh, it's an extruded disc, you have to take it out. Well, it really depends on what the uh, con constitution of the disc is. If it's a soft, juicy disc, yeah, it's probably going to resort. But if it's end plate and it's a big, firm piece of disc, it's not going to. Uh, we know that some of the large discs, as I said it before, are herniations with epidural blood. And even cervical disc, as long as there's not major co uh, compression of the cord, a majority of them do resolve. And in fact, when I first went into practice, I used to lose so many patients with her cervical herniated discs to the neurosurgeons because back then, we're talking a long, long time ago, uh, the, re the response from the other surgeon be, you'd have to get this done because you may be paralyzed permanently. Well, patients can return. They can get their strength back and they can get their sensation back. In fact, the vast majority of patients will resolve their symptoms during the first four to 12 weeks. Again, you're not supposed to keep the patient or torture the patient over this period of time, but understand that you do not have to be aggressive within the first week or two, provided there's not major neurologic deficit. So surgery is not benign, and as much as you think you're great, uh, you're not Superman and you're not super surgeon. And as we talked about before, you know, 85% excellent results with herniated disc surgery. And we looked at our first 100 when we first started TBI, and we couldn't figure out why do 15% of people fail at the right operation. And we also know through studies and, you know, some of the classic studies that 80% of patients do well without surgery. And some of the ridiculous studies show that after two years, there's no difference, but no one's going to uh, tolerate sciatica for two years. And even in adult deformity, surgery, we know that the complication rate can be as high as 40% and up to 8% mortality in some studies. Now, it's not the people that attend this conference, but these, this has been reported. But this deformity surgery is not for the lighthearted and not for the thin-skinned surgeon. So myth number five, workman's compensation patients are crazy and not curable. It's nice if you don't have to take care of these patients. The reality is a lot of these patients are really hardworking folks that have injuries that have to be taken care of. And, you know, in the beginning, it, it's hard to sort of sniff out those that really want to get better and those that, you know, are just going to be a headache for you. So the answer to this one is also false. And we also say if we can't explain their pain, then they must be crazy. Well, the opposite is also true in that sometimes they get crazy because of their pain. So this is where a multidisciplinary approach really is helpful. So the most important factor is when you talk to the patient, find out, do they want to go back to work? Do they like their work? If they like their work and they want to go back, those patients are going to get well. I will tell you that I can't say with 100%, but those are the patients that will have the highest probability of going back to work. And what is their family history? Do they have a happy family? Does their wife, you know, they have a nice relationship with the wife? Or does the wife hate them, the kids hate them? And what about their drug usage? Are they on high dose narcotics for a herniated disc? Well, you know, you and I know that, you know, most of the time anti-inflammatories and occasionally you will need some narcotics, but in general, most patients, you know, can get by without taking heavy duty drugs. So it's complicated by the social, the economic, and the psychological issues. And I just ask you to imagine putting yourself in their shoes. So suppose you had a patient that you know, had a heavy laboring job, he had a family to feed, and he gets hurt, and his boss wants him to keep doing his job. 
I have to tell you from a personal standpoint, I do have a bad back. And if I had a heavy laboring job, I probably would be on unemployment because, you know, you get to a certain point where, number one, you can't keep doing it. So it really depends on the patient. And that's why the multidisciplinary approach is so important. And, you know, we have the different doctors, chiropractic, uh, psychologists, PT, OT, exercise physiologists, and all these are, are helpful to help these patients get their life back. So if you look at some studies, um, private pay disc herniation patients, about 85 to 95% get better. If you take the same indications for surgery, only 60 to 70% of workman's compensation patients get better. Why is there such a, a big disparity? Well, there's a big disparity because of the things we just mentioned. And you still have to uh, evaluate these patients very carefully. And some of them just don't tolerate pain very well and frankly can be obnoxious. And that's why we strongly recommend and use behavioral medicine evaluation to make sure they are emotionally ready for surgery. We never say that you're gonna see the psychologist to see whether I'm, you're crazy. We just say, we wanna make sure that you're emotionally ready for surgery or if you're a candidate for surgery. And Andy Block uh, has been a pioneer in pre-surgical uh, screening. And I think this is available um, commercially. He's worked with the University of Minnesota with us, but uh, if anybody's interested, you can text me afterwards. But in any case, many of these patients, once you get them out of pain, they're usually so grateful and have a completely different personality. It's like, whoa, you know, you walk in the room, you're expecting them to see a grumpy person and whatever. And um, they, they just do a 180 degree turn. So myth number six, all right. So if you're a neurosurgeon, you went through many, many years of training. If you're an orthopod, you went through maybe a year or two less. But now you are a diagnostic and surgical maven. Yay, you finally made it to your fellowship. And now this is going to be the year that you're just going to whip through all these spine cases. False. So the, the hard thing is, is seeing the whole picture. And as a fellow, everything is new. And, you know, you're trying to figure out, number one, uh, what's a doctor like where you, who you work with? Uh, where's your office? How do you get from the office down to the OR? How do you get your diagnostic studies? But, you know, once you get through all that initial shock, you know, you have to learn uh, that the key to diagnosis is listening to the patient and then examining them. And in many cases, and I, I direct this to, uh, to some of the um, fellows that don't do this, you have to always examine the hips and the shoulders because every year, every one of us sees patients that come in with the presumptive L3 radiculopathy with anterior thigh pain, and you watch them walk, and they're walking with an atalgic gait, and somebody else wanted to do a decompression for some stenosis at L3-4, and you take their hip through a range of motion and go, huh, and then you get an x-ray and you see, holy smokes, they have a really degenerative hip. So, you know, that patient needs a hip replacement, not a back operation. So after you do all these things, you have to correlate your physical examination with the diagnostic studies. And diagnostic studies, in my mind, for spine problems include standing AP and lateral, including flexion and extension. I'm amazed at how many second opinions I see and uh, again, this is not for the people on this conference, but in, in our area in Dallas, we see a lot of folks uh, that are practicing spine surgery uh, that are not necessarily the A and B players. And we'll see them come in with MRI scans and they're teed up for surgery and they come for a second opinion. And then we get just a simple F and E and say, whoa, wait a minute, there's something wrong here. We see a little instability. Or the EOS is certainly is becoming much more popular. I wish it was available in our facility, but we're using it more and more. The dynamic x-rays, we have MRI, CT, you know, occasionally a myelogram, CAT scan, occasional CT scan. But remember, all these are static snapshots. And oftentimes, a single study will not do. And sometimes you need multiple studies. Um, and they may show conflicting results. Now, remember, the MRI is great for soft tissue. And in the cervical spine, a lot of the soft disc herniations really are bone spurs. So we are using CT scan more and more. Remember, the MRI scans are made with three millimeter slices, okay? And they average all that information over three millimeters. Depending on the size of the patient, when you uh, scroll through the axial images, you might go through somebody's go from disc to disc 
in maybe three or four clicks. Whereas if you get a CT, which has 0.75 millimeter slices, you really get an accurate view. And plus it's a great um, study so that it gives you your poor man's navigation when you're say doing a cervical decompression or even in the lumbar spine um, of the anatomy and really what to expect. So there really won't be many surprises. So, for example, sometimes, you know, you see a patient and they had a disc surgery maybe five, six years ago, and then they come back with uh, recurrent leg pain. And the MRI scan says that they have scar, but the clinical picture is herniated disc. And you're looking there and saying, well, I don't know, there's some scar tissue there. Could there be some disc in there? And oftentimes, um, they will have a small disc herniation because the nerve is scarred down and it can't move away from the small protrusion. So again, that's a judgment call. You may want to do other diagnostics. You might uh, even consider a discogram to see if dye layers out there. Probably most people wouldn't do that, but just you know, consider that for the patient that comes back with another um, episode of sciatica. So here's a case where the MRI is normal, but the flexion extension film showed that there's a degenerative spondylolisthesis or instability. This is a case, and I'll show you one, where you know, only the MRI scan is done. And then the other thing is, this is a very, very rare condition, um, but the conjoint nerve root in the lumbar spine. Is, and sometimes it's diagnosed as a disc herniation, and sometimes you see it with a disc herniation. And this has serious implications when you're doing the surgery. So don't depend on the radiologist reading alone. You must read the films for yourself. So this is the second time I mentioned this. This is really, really important. So you have to read the x-rays yourself. Remember, you have the patient in front of you. You know what their story is. You've examined them. And the radiologists, unfortunately, they have to report every little thing. And you go through the reports, and it drives me nuts when patients come back and say, what is this? What is that? But remember, you know what's significant, and they do not. And they're doing the best they can. So here's a case that I had seen and was sent to me with this MRI scan. Of course, you know, on the sagittal image, you can still see there's a little degenerative spondy, but the radiologist read it as normal, but they said there may be some fluid into the facet joints. Well, this was, you know, early on, and we knew fluid in the facet joints meant it was un unstable. So when we got the standing flexion extension films, you know, this was like a grade one, maybe an early grade two uh, degenerative spondylolisthesis. So again, get all the x-rays. Now, here's an interesting case of mine. This was a patient who had a real big herniated disc, and it's like, oh, man, this is great. You know, me and the fellow and I, and you can see this was back, you know, about 18 years ago. So the picture on the left, um, you know, looks like a pretty standard herniated disc, but the one on the right shows the conjoint root, and um, you can see the conjoint root right there. It's just that it comes off um, higher and comes off more transversely because it's united or has partial union with the level below. And here's a big juicy disc. So when we first went in there, um, I said, you know what? I, you know, I'm looking at the edge of the dura and I'm thinking, uh, this doesn't look right because the dura seems to be extending out into the nerve foramen. And then we went back and we looked at the x-rays again and we said, whoa. So this could not be approached from the right side, we ended up getting it from the left side, but we could have very easily cut through his L5 nerve root. So again, be very, very careful and look at the disc and look at the images yourself and review all the sequences. Train your eye and, and you know, there's certain art to looking at the MRI scans, but over the year, you're gonna see hundreds of MRI scans. Just get used to scrolling down through the images. So with PACS, unlike the old-fashioned x-rays that I grew up on, a lot of us grew up on, you had the wonderful opportunity to learn about the natural history of spinal diseases by comparing old and new films electronically, following the progression and the evolution of the generation, as well as deformity. And I do this all the time. I get a kick out of it. So here's a patient that I had seen uh, in 2012. He had left leg pain. And the picture on the far right show that there was a left-sided herniated disc at the L4-5 level. So then he came back to me this past June, and he said, oh, my leg pain is hurting me again. So if you look at the middle two pictures, you can see that now the left-sided herniation is gone at the L4-5 level, and it's a right-sided herniation. I'm thinking, oh, God, so what is going on here? 
Uh, that you know, I, I said, well, that doesn't make sense. I'm thinking this in my mind. And his pictures on the on the far left show that he has asymmetric collapse on the right side. So it's not from foraminal stenosis at the L4-5 level, even that that disc is narrow. Uh, let me so on the next uh, sequence, I, I went through the sequence and I went up and looked at 3-4. So on the far right, in 2012, 3-4 looked pristine. But now on the middle panel, which is the current MRI scan, we see that there's really significant stenosis. Now, it's not so much from bony stenosis, but it's from epidural fat. And that more than likely was causing his leg pain. So again, it's kind of cool to be able to go back and look at these x-rays. But again, you have to look at all the films um, to come up with the diagnosis. So here, here, this is a case from Dr. Zager, and it's a very, very instructive case. And this is one of those, you know, listen to the patient, and does this patient need a decompression? So she's 66 years old. She had four weeks of progressively disabling pain and she was miserable, miserable. She couldn't tolerate the pain. So the PCP sends a patient to Dr. Ziegler saying she needs a decompression, da da da. Okay. So now uh, he talks to her, and 90% of her pain is in the back. And her leg pain is really equal, but it's minor. You know, it's 10% uh, it's of her problem. And then he goes in further and finds out that she has a, an abdominal aortic aneurysm. And she saw a vascular surgeon about four weeks ago, said, oh, it was stable at three points. Uh, seven centimeters, no problem at all, no problem at all. Okay, so he examines her, motor, sensory, reflex, everything's fine, negative straight leg raising, pretty unimpressive examination. And then he looks at the x-rays, he can see the um, degenerative spondy there, and, um, but you know, the disc is pretty narrow, so it's been there a while. And um, you know, that, it didn't come on suddenly, that's for darn sure, that caused her back pain. But then he noticed on the, um, lateral view that there's calcification in this aortic aneurysm and he measured it out to be six millimeters. So either the vascular guy screwed up or it's expanding and that is causing her severe crescendo back pain. So what happened? So he sent her back to the vascular surgeon. She gets a stent. She's doing fine. Um, and William Mosler, uh, who was a Canadian surgeon that actually was one of the four founders of Johns Hopkins, uh, suggested, although this isn't a direct quote from him, but he suggested when it's difficult to make the diagnosis, listen to the patient and they will tell you the diagnosis. So, you know, in, in these times where we're sort of running fast and we're running hard and we're, you know, as spine surgeons, we're the thoroughbreds, you got to still listen to the patient because they will tell you and they'll give you the clues as to what is wrong. So again, great case. And this is the third time uh, we're going to talk about x-ray reports and, and you reading them. So you should always study, uh, review the x-rays first. This is after you've examined the patient. Don't look at the x-rays first because what that does, it, it will focus you on an area that may not even be the source of the pain. And you have to document your findings and then Always read the radiologist reading. Demand to get the actual report. Sometimes, you know, we don't have it, but I always tell my assistant, get the report. And then state if you agree or disagree with the readings, because remember, they're calling everything. And just the other day, I saw a patient from um, a large state out west, and uh, the radiologist called, I think, three-level herniated disc. And I'm looking at it, and these are normally hydrated discs, and these had normal posterior uh, rims and normal annulus and totally erroneous. And I just said, I absolutely disagree that, and whatever. If it's somebody local, call them to amend the report, especially if it has something to do with surgery that you may do. For example, sometimes they'll say, oh, the patient has severe stenosis, but you see, yes, the cervical canal is narrowed. There's no cord compression. It has the normal conformation. There's still CSF surrounding it. Or the same thing if they say there's severe neuroforaminal stenosis, and you compare it to the other side and you say, you know what? The, I can still see the nerve root go out. Uh, again, annotate that in your note because you have to you know, protect yourself. And also, you know, you're the one treating the patient. But most importantly about the fish report, and, and although I am not really good about picking up extra spinal um, pathology other than you know, in the muscles around it, but they'll pick up kidney problems and whatever. That's why you want the fish report so you don't miss something or something at the edge of the film. But remember, you're ultimately responsible for the final reading and your treatment of the patient.
So the three most important factors for successful surgery, of course, are selection, selection, and selection. All right, myth number seven. This is a fun one because uh, we're seeing such tremendous uh, growth in technologies today in spine. It really is exciting. So we should embrace all new technology. I mean, everything's great. Let, let's just jump in and do it. Wrong. All right. So here's Scott's problem. You're going to see this in many talks throughout the years, but uh, it, it, Scott's probably is the rise and fall of a surgical technique. So new technologies oftentimes are like fads, and first is great enthusiasm, and then when the reality sets in, when either others can, can or cannot reproduce the same results, it either goes away or stays. But it, it's kind of fun to look back and see all the technology that uh, at least I've seen in my career. And what I've done, I put in red the things that have sort of fallen by the wayside, though things in black are things that we're still using. So the big deal right now is less invasive surgery, regenerative medicine, and um, you know the things we can do with deformity surgery. So with minimally invasive surgery, we have the fusion surgery, we have perk screws, we have X lifts, T lifts. Axial lift was a neat idea where you're actually putting it through the uh, right near the coccyx. We they used to call it the butt lift. That's gone. O lift is here, and that's a good technique. MIS surgery. We had the IDET, which was uh, heating up the inside of the uh, annulus. That's gone. And then we had laser surgery and. Uh, Unless you're a Laser Spine Institute, uh, that's the only people that use it. I think they turned it on to point to the x-ray, but now they're gone too, so they're gone. Tube surgery is here, and it's here to stay, and an endoscopic surgery is also here to stay. Uh, we had all sorts of cages. We had the cage rage of the 90s with cylindrical cages, but now we have a variety of rectangular, expandable, bioactive um, materials and surfaces that make the cages better. Also, um, we have artificial disc today, and the cervical TDR is quickly approaching the gold standard, uh, while lumbar TDRs also do great, but they lag behind in acceptance, and that's for a number of reasons and for another talk. <coughs> Nuclear replacements, they were like the phenomenon. There were like 10 companies at one time and many ID studies, but they're all gone. Soft posterior dynamic stabilization with the assist, unfortunately, uh, we did a lot of those, and patients actually did pretty good, but uh, the insurance companies and the FDA stepped in, and, and they're gone, too. Biologics is a big, big area, and this is going to be, I think, a more important area as time goes on. We have the various bone growth factors, tissue regeneration factors, the BMPs, PRPs, stem cells. Uh, but to me, the most exciting area is that in vitro disc regeneration, and, and at the University of Pennsylvania, um, Dr. Smith is working on this, Harvey Smith and his group. So that's really, really exciting. Uh, a new thing is gait analysis, and this is helping us develop uh, new standards of objective evaluation for our patients. In other words, it's one thing for the patient to say, well, you know, to fill out their A, you know, VES and ODI and all the uh, problems. Uh, but this is actually an objective measure of how fast they're walking and how, uh, what their cadence, what their speed is. Now, robotics and navigation, to me, I, I, I love this technology. And, you know, if you look at it, we, we can instrument every level from C1 to the ilium, and that's something we could never do. And this will continue to develop and get better and better. Now, deformity surgery, I think, is one of the most exciting because you can see what, what our deformity surgeon can do, and they're masters. I, I'm just amazed at how they can correct the curves, the side alignment, but there's still lots of questions. For example, how much correction do you need for a 70 or 80 year old? And do you need age specific correction? Is, should we have different parameters? And what about the difference be between sitting and standing? We fuse these patients based on standing criteria, uh, but when most of these elderly people are sitting most of the day, and do we really have a handle on how best to correct each patient? But I think that predictive analytics will help, and again, uh, there's a lot of folks uh, that are working on this, and they're sitting, I think, in this meeting, including uh, Jens and um, some of our other folks as well. And um, new technologies for the future are also really exciting. So the, the satchel balance and long construction 
uh, reconstructive fusions is the big craze. But I think technology is going to give us an alternative with some hybrid reconstructions and ultimately maybe some motion preserving reconstructions. I don't know what it's going to be. Is it going to be some type of flexible rods? Is it going to be some type of inner bodies we can get into the disk space? I'm, I don't know. But I, I really think that we are going to be looking back in amazement at all the spinal hardware we do today in the future. And I don't know if it's going to be 10, 20, or 30 years, just the same way orthopedic surgeons look at hip fusions for uh, DJD. No one would ever think of doing a hip fusion. Even if they get infected, they revise them to, you know, again, another total hip. I also think that inside out decompressions with robotic assistance and real-time navigation will be in the future. And also 3D printing is, is coming on like gangbusters. You can buy your own 3D printer. In fact, one of our fellows, John Burleson, who's on with us, uh, he is like the 3D printing king of the uh, at least of the fellows that I know, and I think you're going to see big things out of him personally. But uh, anyway, we'll be able to make replacement parts, and we'll be able to make them in the OR. Now, again, that's going to be a while, but in the future, we will have it. So new technologies for the future. Also, I think robotic surgery will continue to expand and be more precise. We'll have biologic regeneration and preservation of spinal anatomy. We'll change our treatment drastically. I mean, just like, you know, the pediatric um, surgeries, I think, and pediatric deformity surgery, I think, is way down, and now we're, we're doing a lot of adult. I think as we learn better how to treat our patients in an earlier stage, we'll see less and less being done. And uh, artificial intelligence will make all of us better diagnostician and also better surgical decision makers because we will have the data with predictive analytics and uh, in the future. So in the words of uh, one of my residency mentors, Dick Rothman, um, when he, we used to chide him and my fellow residents did about trying a new implant because he started out with the Charlie implant. And uh, he said, uh, you know, I'm not going to experiment on my patients. I will use an implant that has a long track record and safe. In other words, he wanted to do the best thing for him. And that's why we have FDA studies. And that's why it's important that we should always be humble. There's lots of new technology coming down the line, but you need to be critical uh, before you adopt it. You need to... Uh, you know, determine whether or not this is something that you would do. So myth number eight, um, you're a highly trained professional, so you don't have to practice your skills. Wrong. The reality is you have to continue to practice your skills. Why? Well, think about the orchestra. And if any of you go to the symphony, they have... I don't know, 100 people in the orchestra, and they play a piece, and everybody plays the same exact note, and uh, they practice and practice so that everybody is perfect. So are we any different? No, we have to rehearse too, just like airline pilots. They go through check uh, you know, simulators every year, so you also have to practice. You, you will become better and better as you gain experience. Your skills that you come out of your fellowship will be very, very good, but your skills 20 years from now will be better and better. So you have to practice and practice, and it starts by studying your preoperative x-rays and to do your preoperative planning. If you're doing robotic surgery like Dr. Lieberman does and talked about in one of our talks previously, you have to do your preoperative planning on the computer so you know exactly what you're planning to do. You want to think about your procedure, and you also want to practice it in your head, taking into account the anatomy. Think about the pitfalls that you may encounter. Think about the instruments you're going to use. I mean, you come to the OR now and you're working with, you know, your attending surgeon and, you know, everything is there. But think about it. I mean, take notes. Some of our uh, best fellows would take notes after every case, noting what instruments that they use or the attending use or they use during the case and little tips. And they would refer them. This is no different than, you know, you see athletes doing. They'll take notes about, you know, different things that they had done and, and what they need to improve upon. So you need to do the same. So think about the placement of your internal fixation. Is it a small sclerotic pedicle? Is the robot going to help you? Think about the expected pathology and the variations that you might see. Think about the large disc herniation that disappeared on a three- or six-month-old MRI scan. 
with partial resolution of their symptoms. I mean, don't be surprised by that. It can happen. And most importantly, you should always prepare, prepare for the worst case scenarios because 99% of the time, the surgery is going to go smoothly. In other words, you should have your plan A and then have a plan B. It is not when the, the stuff hits the fan that you have to develop a plan B. You always have to have what the next thing is, whether it's what I learned from Wilsey, if you'd have a problem, he would walk away from the table. He'd say, Rick, uh, let's look at the x-rays. I'm thinking, why don't we want to look at the x-rays? We know what the x-rays He just wanted a mental break as he's collecting his thoughts and then coming up with the next thing. So my final advice to you is that you are embarking on, I think, one of the most wonderful dynamic careers. Uh, it's afforded me to travel around the world attending meetings and lecturing in five different continents while making many great friends all over the world. And you will have the same opportunity and more if you want. There'll be many challenges ahead, especially with the changing reimbursement, government intervention and insurance issues. But the most important thing, and you must always remember this, always do what is right for the patient. That is your primary goal. And if you have a difficult decision, do the family test. In other words, would I want this done for my brother, sister, mother, father, or grandfather or grandmother? So always remember the family test. This is an important year, and it goes by extremely fast. I mean, we'll be doing these, you know, Zoom talks with uh, the Seattle Foundation till the end of the year, uh, of your year. Try to make the best use of your time. Ask lots of questions. Read as much as you can. Get that foundation and spine so you can build upon for your career in the future years. You'll never have another year like this. And it's sort of like a computer. You will get out of your fellowship directly proportional how much time you put into it. So lots of luck and uh, have a great year. And um, if there's any questions or any chat questions, uh, we'll take them. We have some time. Thank you, Rick. This is Jens and uh, on behalf of our new fellows, and Dr. Skouin here, I want to thank you. And for anybody who's listening here, uh, you can view me as a success or a warning sign, but uh, I gratefully remember receiving an earlier version of this talk by Dr. Geyer, who was my professor at UT Southwestern in around 1986. And I think Scott, another disciple. Oh, yeah, you make me feel so old. <laughs> no, but we just bypass the years. But thank you for sharing your wisdoms. Let me ask you a question on behalf of uh, young practitioners that I always uh, find important, and that is um, how much diagnostic testing should you get as a spine surgeon um, in addition to others? Um, are there circumstances where an MRI alone uh, done like three months ago is good enough, or how much uh, higher should we set the burden as specialists uh, in this medically defensive era uh, to be absolutely cautious? Well. Yeah, that, that's really a good question. We have sort of a rule of thumb in the practice that if somebody doesn't have an MRI scan that is less than six months old, uh, we'll get a new one. So a three-month-old is okay. But I'll tell you the real issue is that not all MRI scans are created equal. Some are great. Like we have a 3T and we see wonderful MRI scans on the neck. You can see the nerve rootlets. You can see, you know, the anatomy of the uh, spinal cord. And sometimes they come in and they're unreadable. So Again, if, if it doesn't fit your clinical picture and you can't make a diagnosis from it, then you're either, you know, unfortunately, insurance companies will probably give you a hard time about getting another MRI scan, although I always try to do that first if we can get a, a high quality one, especially if it's a really a bad one. I, I, the simple answer is you need to get enough information so that you are secure in your diagnosis that you're discussing with the patient. We have a great panel here. Let me just uh, hit on uh, Dr. Sasso from Indiana. Good morning, Rick. So you run a legendary high efficiency practice, just like our colleagues at TBI. Um, my question to you is precise notes are a really big deal in spine surgery. Uh, for a newcomer, this is an overwhelming task. What are some of your uh, tidbits of advice that you give to try to have really precise notes that are insurance proof, uh, lawyer proof, and that help uh, in your uh, clinical documentation? Well, Jens, that's a great question and probably takes more than just a couple sentences. But 
Um, you know, I think it's super important, especially now with EMR. EMRs can really mess us up. Um, it can. I, I think the notes are more confusing now with EMRs than they ever were. I, I agree, Rick. But I think that you need to have a mechanism where you clearly state, especially if you're going to take the patient to the operating room, exactly what your diagnosis is and exactly what your plan is. And where, where in the EMR that is or where in the written chart that is, um, you have to be able to know exactly where that is. So you go to that the night before your operation. The night before my operation, I have all my cases out. Um, I plan them all out. I have the x-rays, MRI scans. You got to have the x-rays because that's what you have in the operating room. You don't have an MRI in the operating room. So transitional anatomy, especially a thoracic case, you have to know absolutely perfectly exactly where you're going to go. You have to know exactly which nerve root it is. And like a third grader, I take a crayon or a big marker and I write, I draw out the nerve root. I draw out the side, I draw out the level. And when I go in the operating room, all those images are up on the, on the board. So the nurses, my scrub nurses, anesthesiologists, everybody knows what operation I'm going to do. We don't even need, we do timeouts and all that, but this was way before timeouts. Everyone knows exactly what the plan is for that operation. Yeah. You know, Rick, your comment about EMR is, is very true because we use drag and dictation. And I most, you know, they say it gets better with time. I find it gets worse with time. I have sometimes patients come back and I read the note. It says, and the patient is not a candidate for surgery. When, when I said the patient is a candidate for surgery. But for the uh, fellows, Ralph Rashbaum, does, one of our older partners, does a lot of medical legal. And he said, you should try to put everything you can in the note. He said, um, you know, unlike some of our other partners that put nothing in the notes, he said, the better you document, the better it is. But I, I think the best thing is that you need to sit down with the patient and you actually spend time doing it. Now, we do have our PAs and our nurses that talk about the surgery. I am still an OCD person when it comes to this. I still go over everything with my patient. And then I will dictate in my note. I dictated the procedure, the risk, the complication, whatever. Uh, it doesn't. You know, it doesn't protect you, but it's really important that you document everything. And it gets you into the discipline as what you just said, which is key for that pre-operative planning. In other words, looking at the x-rays, marking, knowing exactly what you're going to do. And and that, that should be done for every case. And as a fellow, you should try to do it now, uh, even though you may not know exactly what your tending is planning, but try to do it the best you can just to get in the discipline of doing it. Jens, my my tip for the, for the guys would be that, when, the, when you see a new patient and you spend the time with them and you've gotten the history and you've examined them and you've looked at all the diagnostics and then you've formulated your plan, that is the time that you've got everything in your brain focused on them. I make sure that there is a paragraph at the end of that note that summarize it in my words, what my thinking process was. You try to condense it down to just a few sentences because when that patient comes back in, in two weeks or six weeks or six months or three years with a similar kind of problem, instead of you having to go wade through all the EMR, you can always go to your paragraph and know what you were thinking when you had it all in front of you. And I found that to be very helpful um, in, in uh, taking care of patients through the course of their disease. Otherwise, a 20-page EMR, um, you know, kind of looks all the same. Back pain's back pain, back pain, occasional leg pain. But if you've got that little paragraph in your words where you can put little code words to yourself, like uh, this patient has subjective complaints, disproportionate to mental objective findings, that tells me something when that patient keeps coming back that um, I'm worried that there's something else going on other than a physical malady. So um, try to get into that habit where you synthesize it in your words in a concise way on every patient after you've put in the time to get it all together. Thank yeah, you. that's a great tip. I do the same thing too. It's really, really important to do so. Let me ask Scott a question. So uh, you guys have a lot of travel patients, meaning patients who come from far abroad. Um, one of our paradigms here is unless you have a patient with one of those clear no-brainer indications like what Rick showed in one of his first slides, never operate on a patient uh, on a first visit. How do you align that kind of getting to know your patient really well with um, a kind of remote patients who now, especially with the Zoom era, call in for an opinion? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So prior to... Um, the uh, pandemic and the use of telemed being you know, much more uh, throughout the practice, we've 
screen the patients. They'd send in their uh, studies, and we would tell them whether it was worth coming in for a consult. But like you said, unless it's extremely, extremely straightforward, we would not schedule the surgery based upon not a face-to-face -face visit. Now, way to telemedicine, we, we maybe can, can save the patient a trip. So you're actually doing, you know, a face-to-face, -face, you know, trying to do as much physical exam as, as you can. But, you know, as you know, in treating uh, most of the spinal issues, um, physical exam is probably less important than the, than the history and the imaging studies and their, you know, response to previous non-operative management. So, yeah, they all get a consult first. We don't do that European model of medical tourism where they're screened by a, a nurse and then show up for, you know, doctor whoever in Spain uh, and have their surgery the next day. So uh, still try to, you know, still try to, to do things the right way. But, but, Scott, you know, that, you know, with the advent of Zoom, so, Jens, we do do the consult, but it makes me a little... Um, <clears throat> I don't know. I, it's not the same thing as what we used to do. We, we would bring them in for their personal consult, and then we would schedule them for surgery. I've had a couple patients that I've done the Zoom consult, and then we set them up for surgery, and you meet them, and everything's fine, but it makes me feel a little uneasy because I find that those patients have a few more or have much more, more questions and are more needy. I think because of the lack of that personal um, touch. And I think that, you know, in the practice of medicine, there's something about touching a patient, seeing a patient face to face, rather than, you know, like now I'm looking at Scott on the Zoom and, you know, I could tell him what he needs. And then first time I see him, they come in a mask. So we're in a weird time. I don't necessarily like it. And I'm starting to sort of step back and say, you know what, maybe, uh, you know, we need to slow this down, or at least I'm hoping that, you know, we get a handle on this whole COVID stuff. And because it's a little unnerving to see a patient you saw on Zoom, and then they come into your clinic, they're wearing a mask, you're taking the surgery, and you don't, you know, you see their face when they're finally being put asleep, and that's about it. And then post-op, you're seeing them in a mask, and they see me in a mask. So it's different, very different. And, listen, and another lesson learned is is don't schedule anybody for a lumbar TDR or an ALIF uh, without knowing their BMI. It's tough to do sometimes on the Zoom calls. Hey, well, Jim. you know what? I, I've learned. Actually, I had a lady. <laughs> she she needed. Um, I she had a degenerative body, but she was like two hundred and ninety pounds. So um, I she stood up and I said, you know, I said we can help you, or I can send you to one of my partners to do a T lift and whatever, and <laughs> and because I've learned from what Scott said, because you don't want them to come in and expecting to do an ALIF on a person like that. And remember, in our field, the single best medical legal defense you'll ever have uh, for something that goes south is your relationship with the patient. And if you, and that relationship starts preoperatively. So if you've got a good relationship and there's a complication, you got a much better chance of uh, surviving that than if you just met the patient in the pre-op holding area, do a big operation and have, a, have an issue. You've never really established that bond. So I, I, you know, I worry about that as well. And uh, hopefully we won't have to get away from that model you know, for a long time. Hey, let's, yeah, close, it, let's it, close with another master teacher who's been very quiet, Dr. Lieberman. Uh, uh, please take us out from this uh, great session. Thank you, Rick. So words of wisdom from a fellow lifelong learner, Izzy. Jens, thank you for that uh, vote of confidence and the position of honor once again. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, all the new fellows coming in, welcome to the first day of the rest of your lives as spine surgeons. It's a very exciting time. Uh, as been pointed out over and over and over again, every day is a learning experience. Uh, every case you do is something uh, different and just learn from it. Uh, right now, you guys should be like sponges. Absorb everything you possibly can. At the end of fellowship, wring out the sponge. And what's left behind in the sponge, that's what's going to make you the spine surgeon that's going to carry the uh, SSF flag or the TBI flag or um, Indiana, Rick, I don't know what you call your program or SIG, your program, but that's those are the fellowship pearls that you really want. Just collect everything you can and do the best for your patients. Have a great week, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thanks, Izzy. Stay safe.